the uh, Charter uh, Surveyor and Managing Director of Raymond and Pay, also the immediate past president of the John Consultative Council. His name is Afro Raymond. Good morning to you, sir. How are you? Uh, let's see. We got the microphone. Hooker good hooker morning, Renny, and good morning, listeners. Thank you for inviting me onto the show once again to discuss this very important matter, and it's a burning issue of public corruption and theft of public money. I will say it directly. I am not going to use any coded language. Maybe I will later on. <laughs> and uh, what we are dealing with here is a looting of our treasury, and we need to stand up for what is right at all times, yeah, back particularly in, in, for mm-hmm. those people who occupy high office and high positions of responsibility. So this is what we're going to be dealing with in this morning's program. This is a massive, complex fraud involving tens of millions of public money that was spent more than needed to be spent. And pitifully, sadly, that money came out of a portfolio that is intended to provide for the needy people in this country who don't have a proper housing option. It is interesting so that this morning... stealing from the, from the mouths of people mm-hmm. who don't have enough to provide for themselves. So this is, this is true, true stealing, and it deserves the, the, the sternest possible treatment. So I'm, I'm glad you invited me to discuss it. Thank you. It is interesting that this morning you take off your gloves because you were a lot more judicious back in 2013 when you said, well, maybe we're looking at mismanagement here or uh, <laughs> or the misspending of public funds. It turned yeah, out this yeah. morning you say gloves are off. Let's just get straight to it. You examined yes. the Calcutta Settlement Land Scheme mm-hmm. uh, back in May 9th, uh, 2013, I'm referring to, yeah. in which the EGC required this land. Now, let me just ask you for First of all, sure. to take me to the beginning of the land purchase, not from where the HDC got involved, mm-hmm. but take me back to the original owner, yeah. the money that was given him, then taken back, then a different uh, amount paid a, a little yes. later on. Just laid out for our listeners this morning. Yeah. Well, what I want to say, first of all, as a, as a declaration, is that it's a piece of land I'm very familiar with. Mm-hmm. It's north of um, Central Park North. And it's on um, Calcutta Settlement, number two road, opposite the Madras Trace, which is where there's a wasa pumping station. It's about 50 and a half acres of land, gently undulating land. And I'm familiar with it because I did some work on it before for, for four or five businessmen who were the owners of the land. Uh, but that was back in about 07 and 06. So I was, I was, this is part of my professional life. Mm-hmm. In we, our relationship professionally ended about 07 or 08, um, not in a difficult way. I carried the work to a point and they were carrying on with other people. That happens. And in 2010, the, the individuals formed a company and put the property into the company. So the company purchased the property for 5 million DT. Mm-hmm. That was on the 3rd of February 2010. They had, a, they had had a previous agreement going back to about, I think it was 08, in which they had agreed to buy the property from the owner for $17 million. Mm-hmm. They rescinded that agreement in February of 2010, and they also granted a mortgage to the owner of the property. That was Mr. Dio Saran. And that mortgage was for $18.5 million. So right away on the 3rd of February 2010, we have a difficulty. We have a transaction in which... Mm-hmm. A buys the property from B for five mm-hmm. million. Mm-hmm. A previous purchase agreement is is, is is torn up and agreed to be evaporated between the parties. No problem with that. The third transaction is that B is lending A eighteen and a half million dollars under an instrument called a mortgage. Mm-hmm. Now a mortgage is supposed to be an instrument where you're borrowing money and you're using the property as a security. And the tradition the custom and practice and the accepted professional way to do it is that a mortgage is normally for a sum that is less than the value of the property yes, because the lender would yes. want to know that if, they have, if they're unable to get <laughs> money and have to sell the property, they can recover their money. In this case, a property that had been sold for $5 million was mortgaged the same day for $18.5 million. So it, it, to my mind, and I said so in the formal complaint that I, that I was instrumental in preparing, mm-hmm. to my mind it raises an immediate question about the Registrar General's Department and the Stamp Duty Department. Okay, quite. We haven't gotten to the HGC yet because the HGC is down in 2011. Yeah, I want to deal with this top part here because in, it also involves the, the Stamp Duty And in issue. 2010, we have what appears to me to be very close to a tax evasion question where Stamp mm-hmm. Duty is concerned, a breach of professional practice where conveyancing is concerned because you're dealing with somebody preparing a mortgage for a property that in fact was just sold for $5 million, okay? So that it's really, it's, and, and the translation of all of that in, in plain terms is that the property was really sold to the, to the gentleman, the Eden, the Eden Park people, they're called Point Lisa Spark Limited. Mm-hmm. It was really sold to them for a sum of money about 
24 or 25 million dollars that's what it really means but the amount of money that they presented to the inland revenue was five so they only paid tax on five mm. 18.5 plus the two years mortgage at eight and a half percent comes out about 25 26 million dollars now no, that they, the they, first, no, the first let's just, of, just be clear of, on that. How much they actually paid there? What was it? Three hundred and forty thousand dollars? Is that what, what they actually taxes? paid? Yes. Oh, three fifty. Three fifty. Three fifty. And 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 it should have been what from from, from your calculation should have well, been three to four million. Let us say it's um it, it it's thirty million. Seven. It would have been about about two million. Two million dollars they should yeah. have paid. All right. So yeah. that's that, that's yeah. the yeah. tax evasion you spoke about. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yes. And any other thing, of course, is that. Sorry. The other thing, of course, is that going forward, they start to infrastructure the land. So the infrastructure started to be installed in the land. That is roads and water mm-hmm. and lights and so on, drains and so on. And uh, at that point, the property was placed with, a real, with two real estate agents, really. Um, uh, one was Samco, S-A-M-K-O, mm-hmm. and the other one was something called Golden Key. And I have the Golden Key advertisement on my website, afroraymond.net, and the Golden Key web advertisement in 2011 is showing those properties, those lots advertised at $400,000 a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, lots from $400,000 a lot. Now, $400,000 a lot, there were only 264 lots. So $400,000 a lot, even if you multiply <laughs> 264 by 400,000, mm-hmm. you're actually getting a figure that it's, um, uh, you're actually getting a figure that it's really just over 100 million. Okay. You, you're getting just over a hundred million dollars. I think it's a hundred and five million dollars, mm-hmm. hundred and six million dollars. Therefore, the mind is boggling. How could one agree to pay one hundred and one hundred and seventy-five million dollars for a piece of land that altogether, at best, mm-hmm. could only have been sold for hundred and six million? But it, but it was accepted at two. It was first of all handed to them at two hundred million, and they got a discount. Well, I I question that. <laughs> I question, I question yeah, that well. beca- because. I mean, mm-hmm. so that that's the first, the 2010 to 2011 period is interesting. So they're still they're still dealing with it as a private issue mm-hmm. because the three the three transactions that took place on the third of February 2010 took place prior to the 2010 election, and and the, the gentlemen were, were going about arranging their affairs commercially to develop the land and put the lots for sale. Mm-hmm. At some point late in 2011, they came to what what um what you might want to call a bend in the river to borrow Naipaul's phrase. Mm-hmm. And that bend in the river came about when the land was offered to HDC. And you see, this is what is interesting, Renny. The first thing we have to do is to identify when was the land offered to HDC and on what terms. Because the Lyndon Scott valuation, to which there have been several references in the public, at the end of November of 2011, the Lyndon Scott valuation was for $52 million. Mm -hmm. That valuation was executed sort of in a in the second half of November 2011. Mm-hmm. Now, when Mr. Scott came back with his valuation of, of 52, 52 mm-hmm. and Scott is somebody I know, he trained with our firm, I know him, I used to work with him for years. When Mr. Scott came back with that valuation, the next thing we hear on the official record, if you read the press and you, you follow the thing, the next thing we hear is that the, the company, Point Lisa Spark Limited, offers the land to the HDC in January of 2012. So two months later, they offered the land, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which begs the question, why did the HGC request a violation from Mr. Scott and from others two months before? Because the HGC doesn't have money to fling around like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why would they spend mm-hmm. a fee that will be in the order of forty to $50,000 of a professional fee just for a piece of land that somebody drove by and saw? I don't think so. I think that land would have been offered to them at some point in October or November of 2011. Let me and, just ask and, you a and question. And we need to find out what, it, what was, on what terms was it offered. Uh, understood. Let me just be clear. So mm. this land stood an oasis, or w- was there also more land available that the government could use if they wanted to? Sure, there was plenty of land. Uh, right in that area? Yes. yes. Okay, so, so just we, wanted to be clear we, on that. So, yes. so, so the first, the, I'll, I'll come back to the land question, the, the supply of land question. Mm-hmm. So the first thing is that there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue around the dates. Mm-hmm. Scott's valuation is November of 2011. <laughs> Why was he asked to do a valuation? If, in fact, the first offer was in January of 2012 mm-hmm. for $200 million. And there, there's, another, there's another issue you raise, Rani, that's important, which is the issue about the land supply. And I want to talk about that for a little, for a little, bit, a little while, please. And the point is there are, two, there are two issues to look at here. Looking at the immediate question of where that land is, the land is on Calcutta Settlement, number two road, 
which links Coover to Freeport. And it's a back road, so it's west of the highway and so on. Mm-hmm. It's a good back road. And uh, the area has an abundance of Karani land. Karani was closed in 2004. Therefore, if one stood on that land and looked pretty much in any direction, one would be casting one's eyes on state-owned Karani land that was mm-hmm. disused because the, the, the practice of growing sugar had been discontinued. So the question, the burning question is, even if the HEC had, had resolved to build large-scale housing on disused agricultural land mm-hmm. south of the East-West Corridor, even if that had been a strategic decision they had taken, why did they need to buy any land, particularly in that area? In fact, a member of the cabinet told me, a former minister of housing and that, a member of the cabinet told me that when Carney was closed, the decision was taken that they are not going to spend any money for the HGC to buy any land south of the Carney because there was such an abundant supply mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of, of disused land, mm-hmm. land that was now disused in South and Central. They're not going to spend any money. And that cabinet decision, that cabinet policy, appears to have been reversed or sidelined to allow this transaction to go through. So the, the, the policy, that policy, as it was told to me, makes sense um, in, in, in the limited sense of conserving one's cash. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it, there may be other difficulties in terms of consumption of agricultural land and so on, but it makes sense in that sense of conserving cash. It appears to have been disregarded to, to facilitate this transaction. Um, the Minister of Housing mm-hmm. right there, um, M- uh, Minister Mooney Lyle, says um, in, in, in criticizing some of the um, I- information offered in the civil suit, mm-hmm. accused the, the, um, the Minister, Minister Young, of not knowing the difference between Bush and developed land. Mm-hmm. Uh, address that, if you will. Now, now, be, 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 because I'm just trying to follow exactly what, what the foundation is. They were doing the infrastructural development. That is true. But even if we put that infrastructure, what kind of costs are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that that's an important question to look at in terms of how we go forward, whether the land was bush or it was developed land. The the land was put to the HGC as developed land. I mean, I'm, I'm reliably informed that they had to spend more money doing infrastructure because I understand the development that's going there in terms of the number of lots and so it doesn't conform to the design that had been approved before. Mm -hmm. So in fact they've changed the design and so on. The point is that we're talking about Bush and we're talking and we're throwing words and so on. The point is that (laughs) way too much money was paid for that land. Yeah. I'll I'll put it simply. At the time when the owners, the private sector Mm -hmm. owners owned that property and there was no contemplation no active contemplation of state involvement. The land was offered by two real estate agents, Samco and the other the other company I mentioned. And uh, which is Point Lisa Spa? Yeah, Point Lisa Spa but offered the, the, offered the, the land for sale. Mm-hmm. And uh, Golden Key. Yes. Golden Key, that's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Golden Key and Samco offered the property for sale at four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars a lot. Now mm-hmm. ask me this thing. If you are a private owner and you have land for sale at four hundred thousand dollars a lot, two hundred and sixty four lots that could that if all of them were sold on the same day, which is the best possible outcome, and you mm-hmm. collected cash on the same day, the most money you could collect mathematically is one hundred and six million. Yes. Now if you could only collect one hundred and six million, how do you turn around a year later <laughs> and sell that property to the state? And let's just be clear for one hundred and seventy five million. Now one hundred and seventy five million listeners is $663,000 per lot. Mm. So within a year, mm. land escalated in value <laughs> from $400,000 to $663,000, which in fact is about 64% increase in land value in one year. And I want to say, I tell you, and I want to say to Dr. Monila, I hope you're listening to this. I want to say to you that long time when I was in primary school, I'm a little older than you, they used to say that the, the, the cow jump over the moon. <laughs> but the way some of these political, nonsensical <laughs> lyrics are carrying on, yeah. a little bit again, and the dish will run away with the spoon. Hello. So we are not going to have uh, that stealing and that disregard for good public conduct on either side. Because I'm equally hard when it's PNM doing their, their games. On either side, it is not acceptable. We need better in this country. We are not going to let the dish run away with the spoon, with the spoon mm-hmm. with any kind of nonsensical remarks. The fact of the matter is that land could have been purchased for $35 million lawfully if the Land Acquisition Act had been applied. Yes. We spent $75 million 
buying that land. Mm. And our public treasury spent five times more than we needed to spend buying that land. That is the scale of the theft and the waste. An interesting thing to note, I hope Mrs. Prasad Bissess and Mr. Ram Logan could be listening to this bit together with Dr. I'm sure the information will get to them. I, I, I also want to say that it's remarkable that this is the first cabinet, to my knowledge, I'm subject to correction, this is the first cabinet in our history, to my knowledge, Church. where there were two senior counsel in the cabinet. <laughs> two. <laughs> who, who would know better? And they ought to understand yes. the, the, the meaning mm. and the application of the Land Acquisition Act. This, All of this, the only polite way to describe it is that they were seemingly oblivious mm. to the legal options. And the legal option would have been to allow the state to invoke its powers under the Land Acquisition Act in the mm -hmm. face of an unreasonable demand from a landowner if land was required for a public purpose. All of that, the learned people in the cabinet, Mr. Ramada, Mr. Anand Ram Logan, SC, Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bissessa, SC, Mr. Ms. Dr. Munilal has a, has a legal training as well. What were you all doing? 60 years of public education to do this? This the, is a scandal. The Land Acquisition Act of 1994, which mm -hmm. allows the government to move in yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and take property if they find one that it is not, um, uh, well, to, to, to go in and take the property for the good of the greater yes. uh, populace as against it being, um, you know, if, if, if it's unduly uh, asking for too much money from the government. Mm -hmm. I want to stay with one area sure. there, uh, Afra, sure. because we, we got to the point of the $52 million yes, we that did, came yeah. in from the valuation from Lyndon Scott. Mm -hmm. However, the HDC did not just take this and walk with it. They had um, some other another uh, evaluation done and that is what I want to discuss because sure. there lies that question of the $50,000 that is part of the civil suit. Yeah. So let us talk specifically of what happened. The $52 million was the original estimate yes. given and how did we get to the 200 being accepted? Mm -hmm. Who walked in in the center there? Who was authorized to go and do a re-evaluation of the property and what happened? Well, well another evaluation was commissioned from the Commissioner of Valuations. And the Commissioner of Valuations, for listeners, is the government's valuation officer. So they are the ones who prepare valuations as part of the Ministry of Finance. Um, they have offices through the country. You would have heard of them recently in relation to the property tax that was controversial two or three months ago. That's right. But the Commissioner of Valuations actually prepares valuations and gives land, land administration and valuation advice to the state. Okay. And it appears that a request for a violation is made in about February of 2012 from the HDC. And uh, when the opinion was eventually received, I think it was in April of 2012, the figure that the Commissioner of Violations put onto the same land that Mr. Scott valued in November mm -hmm. of 2011, November 2011, 52 million, the figure that they put was 180 million. <laughs> and of course, it, it presents a very stark picture mm. because everybody listening to this program even those people who might be my detractors, everybody knows that if you, have a, if you have a property to value and you get a private valuator to value it and then you get the government valuator to value it, everybody knows the government valuator is always lower. Yes, more it is always yes. much lower. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So who is talking foolishness here? Everybody knows that except when it comes to Eden Gardens. So you get to Eden Gardens and we find a reversal and this is where the dish jumps over the spoon. And Hello. sometimes, sometimes, Rudal, the cow does jump over the moon. Hello. This is exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. and that, so that, you're that, reversing that, reality mm -hmm. and trying to mm -hmm. tell me that that is normal. It is not normal. And it's amazing because I mean, Shocking. For, 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 for this, um, uh, this huh. great disparity to be presented and nobody challenged it. Yeah. It went through the cabinet. It was passed. It's frightening. By the way, listeners, uh, those who are not in Trinidad and Tobago, the Land Acquisition Act of 1994 is not similar to what is called eminent domain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It falls under the, uh, yes, under the yes. same heading. All right, so we have this, uh, this we have this, um, <laughs> this person from the land val uh, validation area can go in and do this, come back with this mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. The cabinet yes. accepted it. It goes in and they pay $175 million for it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So what is happening here is that we have a situation where the Commissioner of Valuations Office prepares a report and the figure is 180 million. I know there was an earlier letter in which he, he, he attempted to dismiss Mr. Scott's valuation by saying it was grossly undervalued and so on and so on. And I want to put another question out there because we need to understand what is being told to us. We need to act like we're educated. We need to act like this is our country. This is our country. This is our money. These people, up to and including the Honorable President Excellency Anthony Kamona, these people are public servants. They are our public Hello. servants. They may be highly qualified. They may be highly empowered 
empowered by the law, but they are our public servants and they are supposed mm. to do our work. They are supposed to serve our purposes. And we need to put a robust question out there and ask in relation to this land, how is it that we got to the point that we were accepting a valuation that was virtually four times more <laughs> than the private valuation <laughs> and nobody in cabinet just imagine that you see that is what i find most amazing just because, fancy yes, that. nobody in cabinet so, watching the public so, purse saw this disparity so, and said stop so let us ask the question and it are difficult questions to be asked but so be it mm -hmm. if i make some people uncomfortable so be it let us ask the question what we are dealing with and i'm going to coin a phrase i'm going to repeat a phrase i coined during the era of mr patrick manning with that unfortunate series of things with mr call hart and udicott and so on mm -hmm. and i'm going to say what we are dealing with at the highest level of the state mm -hmm. the highest chambers of the state which is the cabinet is either a disturbing naivety or a complete lack of rectitude I'll say it again. What we are dealing with at the highest level of our state, which is our cabinet, is either a disturbing naive naivety or a complete lack of rectitude. You take your pick. If you just do them to us. If you want to play games, pick. you want the left hand or you want the right hand? Which one are <laughs> you going to pick? Because you can't have it both ways. My guess is that for Raymond Chartered, uh, Surveyor and Managing Director mm -hmm. Raymond and mm -hmm. Pear, by the way, in sure. full disclosure, uh, your or your company did uh, do some mm -hmm. work for the HDC at some did, point, yes. so we just make that we do, We work clear. for them. Yeah, we work for right, them. What's right is right what's wrong is wrong. Yeah. The immediate past president of the JCC. That's Address correct. this question for me, please. Mm -hmm. um, the former minister says this issue was taken before the Integrity Commission dealt with, so why are you going back there? Well, I think that Dr. Munilal uh, is, is correct in, in the sense, in, in the limited sense, that there was a complaint made, I believe, by Dr. Rowley when Dr. Rowley was leader of the opposition, and I was aware of it, and that complaint at that time centered on an allegation or a concern over the possibility of a, a and I don't use the word bribe, but a commission was paid to an official. I forget the amount of money. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but a commission mm -hmm. was paid to an, to an official. And Dr. Rowley made an allegation on those lines to the Integrity Commission. It was investigated, and that investigation was closed, and they basically felt that the matter didn't have enough evidence. From what I can remember, they, they really rejected the allegation on the grounds of not enough evidence. This is an entirely different matter. And to mix the two matters up, because the, both of them have the word Eden in it. Mm. Eden in it is nothing less than mischief for educated people, Dr. Munilal. Mm. Dr. Lu Munilal, learned Dr. Munilal. It is mischief. This matter we are discussing this morning is about the theft and the waste of public money in a huge sum, about buying a piece of land for five times more than you needed to pay for it, for buying a piece of land in an area where there was abundant public land available, for buying a piece of land on which I'm reliably informed further money had to be spent on infrastructure. Follow the money is what Absolutely. Minister Young says he's Absolutely. going to do. Yeah. And in following the money, I am just a, a little uncomfortable. I am optimistic sure. that this is just a door opening, but I'm a little uncomfortable because the only target I see is a $50,000 um, bribe, alleged bribe, yes. that was paid for this valuation situation. But... There's a lot more money involved here, and I don't want, I hope it does not end uh, singularly. I know on the one hand, you called back in 2013 mm -hmm. for us to follow through with the tax evasion side of it, sure. because something funny had gone on there, clearly yes. from what you articulated yes. this morning. But I'm, I'm hopeful that this is not just a $50,000 uh, $50, issue that we're dealing with, and you yes. get a lot more fish while, when the net comes in. Yeah, it would be a real pity. If, if what came out of this, a couple of people have said to me cynically, Rennie, it would be a real pity if, what, if all that came out of this was that a relatively medium-level public servant <laughs> yes. was prosecuted for accepting a payment that he ought not to have accepted. That Hence would be the reason I raised it, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, the real big question is, and I'll tell you mm -hmm. what is interesting, mm -hmm. eh, Rennie, let's talk about the, nowadays we have a phrase that we mm -hmm. use about anti-money laundering and know your customer and... Uh, that sort of thing. And and one of the concepts that is alive in all of that is the concept of the ultimate beneficial owner. Mm. So somebody, something will say something is in a company. Somebody will say a property is in a company's name. And this company is selling the property to that company or selling their shares. The question really is, for the investigators and those people who try to clamp down on white collar mm. crime and tax evasion, the question really is, who is that company? A company is not a company. 
Mm-hmm. You see, the whole concept mm-hmm. of ultimate beneficial ownership goes to the heart. Who is the biological person or persons who own that company? Who are the beneficiaries? Let um, me pause you right there, yeah, Afra, because yeah. that's a very important point you're making. Because part of the problem here mm-hmm. is you say, well, if uh, Point Lisa's Park, mm-hmm. if in fact, you know, they made an offer. It doesn't matter what happened. The government accepted it. We did our legal, uh, we did our proper thing here. They did not do their due diligence, whatever they accepted mm-hmm. the figure. We, you know, we're a pilot. We have a bunch of pilots. I mean, we, we, we have nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. However, as you said, if you go mm-hmm. to who are the principals, who are the people involved mm-hmm. in that point, Lisa Spark, who are the ultimate uh, beneficiaries of it, then you have a wider net to, 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 to yes. pull in. Go ahead, yes. please. Mm-hmm. And the point I'm trying to make is that, in fact, if you examine the Registrar General's files mm-hmm. for Point Lisa Spark Limited, the company had directors, and the directors have been named in the press. The names of the individuals are not really material to this matter because the fact is the company never issued shares. So under the sort of under the sort of rubric of how one would trace who owns a company, <laughs> they they had managed to find a way to sidestep the transaction. Another mm. interesting wrinkle to note for listeners is that up until the end of 2014, under our country's <laughs> an, anti-money laundering laws. Any transaction involving land and property, you had to know who the ultimate beneficial owner was. Except, and this is the loophole that was beautiful, except if it was a government department or government company or government agency. Mm. At the end of 2014, mm. that loophole was, was remedied. And, and, and that was an important step forward. The other thing is that, the point I'm driving at is that we don't know who Point Lisa Spark Limited really was. Were there people in the cabinet who were Point Lisa Spark? Who was Point Lisa Spark? We know who the directors were. Mm-hmm. We know they mm-hmm. own this piece of very valuable land. There must have been oil or gold or something below there. We know they own this piece of land. But U- unique among all, all, all the state land that remained from Kerry, they? this particular parcel was special. Yeah. Who, who are you these people? The, and and yeah. this, this is really one of the questions. So mm-hmm. the whole anti-money laundering channel of discussion is, is very fertile in this question. And the other point is that there was a, there was a, a falling out among the parties and there was a lawsuit which in fact allowed us to get a lot of information. Falling out of the parties, you mean the Point Lisa's the, company? Those, those people fell out. Okay. Yeah. The mm-hmm. actual private <laughs> individuals who, who were um, doing the business together. And, I and this falling out happened after the land was purchased? No, it was before. It started, it started to rumble and then it kind of spilled over. Okay, so they filed a lawsuit to follow the in like mm-hmm. 2012. They filed a lawsuit in 2012. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is interesting is that they are, um, at the Point Lisa's people are mm-hmm. actually benefiting from the transaction. I mean, I think I think some, some amounts of money have been traced and so on. But the real beneficiaries have not actually been identified. An immense profit was made. <laughs> um, as, 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 the, as the press has said, over $100 million. I think it's, it's over <laughs> nearly $140 million in profit was made. It is one of the reasons I asked you earlier so, as a surveyor yourself, the infrastructural work that was done there, mm-hmm. what, what kind of dollar figure you think that would have amounted to? Well, the lawsuit figures we saw, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about what we can, what we can identify. Let's just bear with me. I'll tell you where sure. I'm with this sure, in a second. Sure. Yes. The lawsuit figures that we saw, and the lawsuit was filed, and I, I, I got a copy of the filing. The lawsuit figures that we saw um, identified a figure of $29 million. Mm-hmm. Whether that mm-hmm. was actually spent, I don't know, but the, but the person, the contractor, was mm-hmm. claiming that he had spent $29 million, and in fact, there had been some correspondence where that figure had been agreed. And listeners, the reason I asked that question sure. is because if the, if the, if the um, private valuator said 52 million and then you put 29 million on that you end up at about 81 how you arrive at 175 because this is the money that we're talking about that uh, if, if i quote something you said back in uh in 2013 you said the hdc purchase must be reversed and the responsible parties investigated and prosecuted as required by law mm-hmm. so i'm trying to identify what are we going after we're going after yeah. the difference of that money when we try to follow the money here sure let me just say to you i will reverse your arithmetic and i would say to you the 50 Two million dollar violation, Mr. Scott did. Yes, included the twenty nine million dollars of work <laughs> that was okay. done in twenty ten and twenty eleven. Okay. Mr. Scott prepared his opinion at the end of twenty eleven. At the end of it. So that twenty nine million dollars, we're just saying there was a figure that was agreed between the parties, but there's a true it figure. Was included, we don't know. Uh, yeah. Was included. Mm-hmm. In it was not twenty nine mm-hmm. plus mm-hmm. plus fifty two. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Gotcha. And I started off saying that the land in February of twenty ten would have been about twenty five mm-hmm. plus twenty nine, so you're getting about fifty. You see. Okay, that's uh, where we're going. It's going to be really interesting. What, what, and what you expecting to get out for, for for us as taxpayers for the country? What are you expecting to see come out of this uh, this civil suit, this civil case? Well, well, I think it's yet another interesting development in how we 
in how we move ahead with with the country. I'm I'm happy to see it because there was a there was a particular level of involvement by myself and my colleagues, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But I'm I'm a little bit I'm a little bit cautious. My optimism is cautious because we are still seeing the specter of uh, of um, governments prosecuting previous governments, and I think I think when we really make progress mm. will be when we see governments prosecuting quotation marks their own people. Mm. Close quotation marks. We're not there yet. So the question, are we there yet? And the answer is, we're not there yet. We're taking steps and we're on the road. There may be another question. The other question to that is, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you yes. deal with what was there before? Yes. Or be, be, because you, you've got one thing in front of you right now. Sure, sure, sure. I'm not... I'm not. And, and if this is indeed a precedent yes. that's being set, because part of the argument, bear with me for a second, sure, sure. part of the argument raised is this. This government, not this one, but any government, any present government anywhere in the world does not want to prosecute a previous government for fear that when they lose election, then the table is turned. Yes. So that is the sort of um, wink, wink, wink that goes on. Mm-hmm. However, if the precedent is set here, then it means no sacred cows. Yes. So I, I think this is very, it's, it's in, very important. It's because it is, yeah. Yes, it is going to help us to, to, to expect Yes. Uh, those who um, do we not say that anybody did anything wrong? We just raising questions about what obtains, and I'm saying if something comes out of this, it is going to be a wonderful shot across the bow. Yes. Well, I think that you asked me what I can expect, and the other thing I would mention here is that this is a, a civil lawsuit. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not a prosecution, and there are no arrests, as far as I'm aware. And it's a civil lawsuit, and the reason for doing that, as far as I can tell, is that the civil lawsuit has a, a lower threshold of, mm-hmm. of evidence and mm-hmm. so on and therefore there's a higher chance of success if one is seeking to inflict some kind of a penalty or recompense for wrongdoing in office the natural extension of that would mm-hmm. be uh, what do you see coming out of this and do you see anybody being prosecuted as a result of what is unearthed from this yes i, I see prosecutions in the future i certainly would like to see prosecutions because as far as i'm concerned it's, it's on the books it's inescapable <laughs> on the stamp duty charge mm-hmm. there are other there are other issues of breach of trust and fiduciary duty yes. and so on that mm-hmm. emerge rooted in the civil lawsuit but really that stamp duty evasion is a crime okay that stamp duty evasion carries heavy penalties including mandatory disbarring for the attorneys involved, mm-hmm. including five times the amount of stamp duty that you evaded has to be paid as penalty for the state. And that money is also given as a reward to the organization that made the report, which was the organization I was president of at the time, JCC. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, you see, there's progress, there's backwards and forwards all the time. Eh? So this is really a terrible moment to realize mm. that, in fact, we have uh, this degree of stealing and waste taking place in our country. And, of course, it, it, it's riding alongside with a little companion that is that is seeking to sort of distract us and call it different names and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. But what is really interesting is that at that time, we mm-hmm. made a report. We made mm-hmm. a, Apart from my newspaper articles in 2013, it was first mentioned in the budget debate for the 2013 budget at the end of 2012. Um, Dr. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Rowley and Mr. Arawi mentioned Eden Gardens and they had they mentioned concerns over it and so on in the budget debate then. I delved into it deeply in the first half of 2013. Mm-hmm. And uh, the JCC, which I was president of at the time, made a formal report on the 22nd of July 2015. And that was important for two reasons. Number one was that the people who had the company, Point Lisa Spark Limited, because I was monitoring this in the background, as they say, in Trinidad, Jumbi and them. <laughs> the people who had, the people who had that company, had actually applied mm. to the company registrar to have the company wound up. They said the company is not trading anymore. <laughs> it, it, there was a single asset. We've sold it, and we'd like to apply to have this company wound up. The company registrar, which was which was her duty, said yes. Okay, we can wind it up in X period of time, and she put a notice on their file. They said this company has been applied to be wound up mm. by this date. And our our report, the formal report JCC made in this matter, was filed on the same day the company was to be wound up. And I mm. wrote to the registrar and I said to her, Madam, Hold your head. I'm aware that an application has been made to do this thing. Mm-hmm. I'm aware you've given conditional approval. But in fact, it is a formal report mm. has now been made to these we made reports to six law enforcement agencies. A report has now been made to these six agencies, and no doubt the matter will be under investigation. Please hold your hand. She held her hand. So here we are. Mm-hmm. So the first significant thing is that the persons involved in that company try to wind it up 
and put it in a great big hole and plant a tree on top of it you, and so on. You put together a company for a single transaction. Yeah, a single it asset. is done and then we're gone. Yeah, that's a normal thing in the commercial world. Oh, that's normal. Huh? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. it's normal. Mm -hmm. but, but the second point is this, is that it was an important moment in terms of professional development because we had a professional association making a report in writing to law enforcement about one of its members. And that was a significant milestone in this country. I don't believe the Law Association has ever done it. I don't believe the accountants have ever done it. I don't believe the bankers have ever done it. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't believe the doctors have ever done it. The JCC did it. And colleagues, um, I think it was it was a milestone. We, we have contributed to us getting to this point. And this is important. Afro Raymond, my guest uh, this mm -hmm. morning, first guest charter, the mm -hmm. surveyor and managing director yeah. of Raymond and Payer Limited. Uh, we're talking about the $175 million paid by the EHDC for a property um, that he uh, argues could have gone for, uh, uh, what, $32 million initially. Uh, however, even when there, there was a private valuator, he said $52 uh, million, including infrastructural work. It was eventually mm -hmm. sold mm -hmm. uh, for $175 million. I'm curious about this. This in conclusion, uh, yes. looking at the names here who are named in the suit, are you comfortable with this? Uh, it, I mean, the, 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 the nine defendants, well, ten of them, Jolene John, who is the former head of the yes. HGC, Henkel Lau, former HGC uh, chairman, Greg Davis, former deputy HGC chairman, Peter Ford, project specialist, um, the former commissioner of valuation, Ronald Harry Lau, Point Lisa Spark Limited, Anthony Sampath, Everell, Russ, interesting name, mm. and Patrick Soon Ting. Are you happy that all parties are covered in this? Um, I mean, save and accept until we get to who the principals behind PAP was. <laughs> I mean, they have, they have more people to, to put on mm. that list. Um, I, I, I don't know whether they will ever put them because we live in a we live in a country that has all kinds of compromises and so mm -hmm. on. I don't know if they will ever get on the the, the list, but we need to put more people on because. As I said in my earlier remarks, there were attorneys, prominent, well-educated, experienced attorneys who were involved in preparing all this. This mm -hmm. could not have happened without the, the professional assistance and guidance of attorneys. And another point that emerges in this is that given that the property was transacted in, oh, sorry, was conveyed in February of 2010 for $5 million, which was <laughs> probably one-fifth of its true value. Mm -hmm. Given that the property was conveyed for that figure, that was a that conveyance was at a was at a, a, a false statement of consideration. Given that there is there is learning in law that that represents a defect in title. So quite apart from any question of dollars and cents, why is the HEC buying property with defective title? Why are they buying it? Yes. Yeah. Mm, you see, and it yes. comes. It speaks to the heart of the question, mm -hmm. Rennie, because we're talking about we we, we sort of taking apart the HEC transaction, and there's another way to look at it. You know. And the other way to look at it is to remove HTC from the picture. And this makes it even more interesting. Mm. What we call Plan B. Let's suppose Point Lisa's Park Limited decided that they weren't going to go ahead with their own development. They were trying to sell these lots. It wasn't working out the way they wanted to. And they wanted to try something different and to sell the whole thing to one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about Point Lisa's Park mm. owners. They're coming out of the game and they're selling the land to somebody else. And let's suppose that Plan A, which was the HTC, didn't work for whatever yeah. reason. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Who else was going to buy that land? And how much money would they have paid? <laughs> would Mr. Jack Warner have bought it? And that's why it's so important that you said we want to find out if you yeah. put it up at $400,000 a lot, how many you sold? Be because it's going to make the point as to whether anybody else would have bought it uh, at, at, yeah. at the real price, well, at, at, at the, at the yes. price that's yes. probably acceptable as against the inflated one that you yeah, presented. exactly. Yes. Would, mm -hmm. would Mr. Jack Warner have bought it? Would Mr. Dupree have bought it? Bought it? Would Mr. Lockjack have bought it? The, the tycoons in the society, would they have gone to Coover <laughs> and paid $150 million, $160 mm -hmm. million, 140 for that land? And, and you need to contemplate <laughs> that when you're preparing a violation in that sort of situation. You don't just listen to the one client. Like what you're examining is the market. What is the market for this land? Mm -hmm. Who would mm -hmm. buy this land? What would, they, what would be their considerations as a rational investor? And that's how you prepare the valuation. The views of my guests are mm -hmm. for Raymond, not sure. necessarily of this station, but it is here <laughs> <laughs> in his capacity. I just want to uh, just close one part yeah. here. I did mention uh, Everell Ross as is a very interesting name. He is actually the officer at the Commission of Valuation Office who did the valuation value in the land at $180 million. He was added in after the initial thing of nine people, and I wondered if that was to make sure we have something inside of there to, 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 to bind this. 
as we do with um, putting what is it, uh, flour, you know, flour with fish to bind it together. I wonder if there was a reason for that, but I'm, I'm optimistic <laughs> that this will um, w w will go further. We will continue looking at this as, as, as more is revealed. Afro Raymond, as you know, has spent a lot of time, a lot of time yes. at the helm of the CL financial situation. Yes. That's I don't know about the helm. That's <laughs> I, was, I was on the balcony looking down. <laughs> <laughs> at the helm of advocacy, of, of, of calling for accountability. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, uh, we're going to come back and have a, a discussion uh, on CLF, and uh, we will use that opportunity to introduce our second guest, oh. David Michael Rudder. Uh, a couple of things have changed since then, um, including the fact that um, <laughs> Mr. Noriega fell out with the United States. They took him, so uh, folks stopped moving the money to Panama. I think that's probably one of the reasons why FATCA came, but anyway, that's a whole different conversation. It's, a, <laughs> it's also but, another reason the exposure of, oh. the, uh, of the list of names yeah. of people who were uh, involved but, in that. But what's interesting is that one of the parties involved in the, Pan in the, in the Eden Gardens Bobol was a contractor, the, one of the people who sued. Remember I mentioned a lawsuit. One of them who sued was SIS. He was one of the parties. <laughs> and of course, it, it, is, it was widely reported that he, just after the election, departed for Panama. Widely so Calypso, reported. Widely reported. So the, that, that is Mr. Yeah. Lala. The Calypso Panama by David Rudder. Most appropriate. Good vibes as ever, David. Fantastic. Four minutes away from the top of the hour, Afro Raymond is my guest. As mm -hmm. I said, we're expecting yeah. uh, Peter Permel to join us. He is the chairman of the Clico Policy Holders Group. Sure. But Afro uh, has been following this uh, CLF situation for a long time. Yes. And that is where I want to go into one area of mm -hmm. that, uh, b b because Peter, uh, of course, will delve in it from the policy holders side of it. Sure. I, I do want to deal with the question of Mr. Dupre because the, the, the front page of today's uh, newspaper says it's a spiteful act is how he calls this, um, the move by the government to liquidate um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the assets. The question that uh, is before us now is the question of do you agree uh, with Mr. Dupre uh, that this is indeed a spiteful act? to uh, liquidate for what they claim to be uh, a value less than what the company is worth. Uh, they, 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 the fear being that this is going to be a fire sale. Well, the whole question of a fire sale and the approach to the bail out, these are really complicated questions. I mean, there's a, there's a level of moral outrage and a, a simple question of what's right and what's wrong. And it, it, is, it is therefore calling on our deepest reserves of patience and consideration when one is considering the case of somebody like Mr. Dupree, who, when it was good, when CL Financial had it good, mm -hmm. and they had it very, very good for many years, the company did well. It was a leading company in the region. They made, they made bold, ambitious acquisitions. They were, they were in the liquor market. They were in real estate. They were in energy. And the company was also in the financial world. They, were, they did very well. And... The model itself could be questioned, but my point I'm making is that when things were very, very good, we've had reliable reports that the chief people in the company didn't pay any taxes. Mm. So you see, we really have to deal with the question of who is who and what is what. You know, I don't want to get biblical as a Sunday morning, and it's not my way, but um, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So you had all of these things, and you did very, very well. And when you were making it, and nobody's grudging that you're making it, you weren't prepared to pay your part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet here you are at the, at the bar of public opinion, mm -hmm. calling for mercy. I think they want consideration. You want to accuse people of being, um, what's the word? What's the word? Uh, spiteful. spiteful. Spiteful, you know? Um, uh, spiteful. And it doesn't, I could tell you, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a banker or any of that. I'm not an accountant, any of those fancy things. But I could tell you as a citizen who pays all my taxes, and I make sure to do it. I'm a successful citizen who pays all my taxes. My company pays all our taxes, and we make sure to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it is part of our responsibility as, as proper citizens in a republic. I could tell you, Mr. Dupree and your cohort, I could tell you it does not sit well. So that's the first thing that does not sit well. When you're missing, that does not sit well. When At the bar of public opinion, mm -hmm. and you have conducted yourself in that manner, it does not sit well. It also does not sit well when there's a lawfully convened commission of inquiry to examine why the group collapsed. Mm -hmm. And yourself and Mr. Montai, who were the two main people, according to Sir Anthony Coleman at one point, you were Batman and Robin. Okay, one was Batman, the other one was Robin that there could be a commission of inquiry mm. and the both of you 
could be represented by by senior counsel. One man, I think Mr. Dupree, you had um, you had a Queen's counsel from England, and Mr. Monda, you had Mr. Martin Daly, senior counsel. Mm -hmm. And the both of you could take the position throughout the inquiry that you're not going to say anything on the grounds of self-incrimination. And, and that is fine. And again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a banker. Those people are more educated than me. But I could tell you, sir, it does not sit well. Mm -hmm. If Abu Bakr not testifying at the Commission of Inquiry about the coup mm -hmm. did not sit well with me as a citizen, your failure and or refusal to talk and explain what happened, it does not sit well with me as a citizen. So I'm saying to you, those things would weigh against you. At no point have we heard anything resembling an apology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. an explanation. And in mm -hmm. fact, in the absence of an apology, in the absence of an exp explanation, in the absence of testimony, in the absence of paying your taxes, mm -hmm. you're now putting forward a proposal, and I haven't seen it. I've seen reports of it. it kind of, I think there's a Price Waterhouse plan. I forget what it's called, Operation Rebirth or something. <laughs> but there's some sort of a plan that's being put forward. And, and, and citizens, listen to this. Would you believe that after all of that, the plan being put forward for the return of CL Financial to the Mr. Dupree and his cohorts is a plan that's like a higher purchase. They're going to give us some <laughs> of the money now. <laughs> they're going to give us some more money down the road. And two years from now, they're going to... Would you buy a used car from that man? I am going to wait for Peter Permel, who is the chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group, I who, tell have, you. who they have joined together as shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. And they oppose uh, the government uh, having a director there as the government to remove uh, that person from the board of directors. Mm -hmm. And when Peter comes here, I'm yeah. going to ask that question because sure. it does it does, it, it, it does uh, mm -hmm. hit a scale uh, that's disturbing on the one hand, uh, it is this, the direction of, uh, of a board that took you to where you are, caused a problem, mm -hmm. and now you're telling me, wait, Dorothy, wait, your money is on the way, in the meantime, uh, we will take back control of it, and then uh, find a way to pay you back. I am sorry, that IOU is not good enough. Yeah, it, it really is, it really is a very worrying uh, question, and uh, what we got to is that, I think I want to mention the I think I want to mention the letter to the central bank governor that I wrote together with two colleagues. We prepared this letter together, and that was David Walker, who's a, a campaigner for financial transparency. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's been a guest on this program. And then, of course, there's our colleague Rishi Maharaj, who is the CEO of Disclosure Today, the transparency NGO. And our letter to the governor of the central bank was on the 31st of January this year. Mm -hmm. And we put three main points to the governor. And it's important at this, at this juncture, now that we're discussing the sort of end game of the, of the whole bailout, it's important to get to get, put those things in context. The first point we put to the governor was that despite the serious concerns about the misconduct of Mr. Dupree and his cohort, the fit and proper rules had not been applied. Mm -hmm. And in fact, those rules needed to be applied so that those persons could be disqualified from ever having any role as a director, an officer, or a controlling shareholder of any financial institution. They had not been applied. So in fact, fit and proper rules need to be applied. The second point was that in fact, the company was stated at several points by various official statements, and the company being Clico, to have returned to financial health and so on. If that was so, mm -hmm. under Section 44 of the Central Bank Act, the Central Bank needed to release its hold over Clico. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, if indeed, and thirdly, mm -hmm. if indeed, on the one hand, you are not going to return the company to the original controllers, and on the other hand, the company is leaving the control, mm -hmm of the central bank, where do those assets go? Apple because, Raymond. in fact, that is something we need to be discussing. We need to get out of discussing it as a simple binary. So either it's Mr. Dupree or we sell it on the stock market. Are there other options? Could those assets be sitting in the unit trust? Could those assets be sitting in national um, National Enterprises Limited. How else can we locate those assets so that they are out of the hands of those irresponsible parties? We are not here by accident. We are not here by a natural disaster. We are not here. What happened here has nothing to do with Wall Street. This is high irresponsibility, and that is why we are having this conversation now. After Raymond, I'm going to ask you to hang around. I'm going to spend. I'm going to spend uh, the, 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 the next 20 minutes or so with Mr. Peter Permel, who just joined us. He's the chairman of the Clico Policyholders sure, Group. Sure. We're going to talk about. 
uh, about uh, th this position with CLF and the government uh, moved to liquidate uh, the assets because I, I, Mr. Perlman and the policy uh, holders group, they have joined together with other shareholders yes, yes. and they are opposing the moves by the government. After we said that, I'm going to bring you back in the conversation. If you have the time for that, it's going to be very interesting for us to run that this morning. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. You're inside brunch from 107.7. Good morning.